Thank you all for being here today. I'd like to begin by speaking about the groundwork that we have laid over the past year. Last April, I outlined our administration's approach to our economic relationship with China. President Biden and I are clear-eyed about the complexities of this relationship. Our priorities include protecting our national security and that of our allies, advancing an objective of a healthy economic relationship with a level playing field for American workers and firms, and cooperating on China where both countries can and must. It's undeniable that the U.S.-China relationship is on a stronger footing today than this time last year. And this was not preordained. It was the direct result of President Biden's guidance to me and his cabinet to intensify our diplomacy with China and put a floor under the relationship. Over the past year, I've met in person with my Chinese counterpart, Vice Premier, Premier He Lefeng, three times, including in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I call my second home. We established economic and financial working groups that have seen substantive, in-depth conversations. These build on the candid and constructive meeting between President Biden and President Xi in Woodside, California last November. Through these exchanges, my team and I have been able to advance the interests of the American people. We have set forth our own economic policy priorities and gained an improved understanding of China's. We have advocated for specific steps to ensure American workers and firms are treated fairly. We have directly communicated American national security concerns, and both countries have clarified potential misunderstandings to prevent unintentional escalation. And we have restarted cooperation on, on issues where our interests coincide. Last November, the Vice Premier and I took the important step of affirming key areas of agreement, including a commitment to work toward a healthy economic relationship that provides a level playing field for both countries. This progress matters. Given the size of our economies, the U.S.-China economic relationship is among the most important bilateral economic relationships in the world. And it matters deeply for American workers and firms. In turn, the American people expect their leaders to do the hard work of economic diplomacy. That's not the type that always generates headlines. It's one that keeps at it despite the noise in order to advance a responsible approach to the complex challenges that we face. President Biden and I are committed to such an approach, and it's what brought me here to China. Over the past week, I've had the opportunity to make progress on issues that matter to Americans. I've had productive, direct, and extensive meetings over four days in Guangzhou and Beijing with China's economic leadership including Premier Li, Vice Premier He, Governor Pan, and Finance Minister Lan. I've also met with those outside of the central government, including American and other foreign businesses, Chinese academics and students, and local government leaders with practical, on-the-ground economic policy responsibilities. Let me outline three areas where we've made significant progress this week. First, Vice Premier He and I agreed to launch intensive exchanges on balanced growth in the domestic and global economies. This represents an important part of my effort to advocate for American workers and businesses 
and gain a better understanding of certain PRC macroeconomic policies. Let me explain. During conversations this week, I underscored again that the United States does not seek to decouple from China. Our two economies are deeply integrated, and a wholesale separation would be disastrous for both of our economies. Even as we take action to diversify our supply chains, we seek to preserve the broader trade and investment relationship that can benefit American workers and firms. China is a key market for American products and services, and competition between our firms can spur greater dynamism and innovation in American industries. The American businesses that I spoke to in Guangzhou underscored the significant benefits of a healthy economic relationship. At the same time, I expressed concern to senior Chinese officials that there are features of the Chinese economy that have growing negative spillovers on the U.S. and the globe. I am particularly worried about how China's enduring macroeconomic imbalances, namely its weak household consumption and business overinvestment, aggravated by large-scale government support in specific industrial sectors, will lead to significant risk to workers and businesses in the United States and the rest of the world. China has long had excess savings, but investment in the real estate sector and government-funded infrastructure had absorbed much of it. Now, we're seeing an increase in business investment in a number of new industries targeted by the PRC's industrial policy, and that includes electric vehicles, lithium-ion batteries, and solar. China is now simply too large for the rest of the world to absorb this enormous capacity. Actions taken by the PRC today can shift world prices. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. And we've seen this story before. Over a decade ago, massive PRC government support led to below-cost Chinese steel that flooded the global market and decimated industries across the world and in the United States. I've made clear that President Biden and I will not accept that reality again. I know that these serious concerns are shared by our allies and partners from advanced economies to emerging markets. China's excess capacity is built up over a significant amount of time and our concerns will not be resolved in a week or a month. But the exchanges that we announced during this trip will provide a dedicated structure for us to raise our concerns about China's imbalances and overcapacity among a wide range of other topics in a detailed and targeted manner. We intend to underscore the need for a shift in policy by China during these talks, building on the over two hours I spent on this topic with the Vice Premier last week. This is part of our effort to advocate for American industries and prevent the significant economic disruptions we've seen in the past. It's important to note that I firmly believe that addressing these imbalances in an, in an appropriate way will not only be good for the U.S. and the world, it will also be good for China's long-term productivity and growth. Importantly, we have and will continue to emphasize that our concern about overcapacity is not animated by anti-China sentiment or a desire to decouple. Rather, it's driven by a desire to prevent global economic dislocation 
and move toward a healthy economic relationship with China. Second, I was pleased to announce that we're expanding cooperation with China in our sh shared work against illicit finance. At home, President Biden and I have taken major steps to prevent illicit actors from exploiting the U.S. financial system and to hold them accountable when they do. But the United States cannot do it alone. Weaknesses in financial regulatory regimes abroad, in China and other countries around the world, also provide an avenue for financing for criminal organizations, human traffickers, drug traffickers, fraudsters, and other malicious actors that can harm Americans and our national security. From now on, a new joint treasury PBOC cooperation and exchange on anti-money laundering established during this trip will enable our countries to share best practices and information to clamp down on loopholes in our respective financial systems. I've asked my team to begin these meetings very soon, and we look forward to reporting on our progress. I'm also pleased that illicit finance is a critical component of Treasury's work with the PBOC as part of the US PRC Counter Narcotics Working Group. Exchanging information on money laundering as it relates to trafficking of fentanyl and other illicit synthetic drugs can help us disrupt the flow of illicit narcotics, precursor chemicals, and equipment. The opioid epidemic is a crisis that affects every community in the United States, large or small, with more than 150 Americans dying each day. Treasury is committed to using all of our tools, including international cooperation, to counter this threat. Third, we're announcing that we will continue a series of financial technical exchanges between the United States and China. Just like military leaders need a hotline in a crisis, American and Chinese financial regulators must be able to communicate to prevent financial stresses from turning into crises with tremendous ramifications for our citizens in the international community. Over the past few months, we've hosted several exercises with China, including on how we would coordinate if there were to be a failure of a large bank in either of our countries. I'm pleased that we will hold upcoming exchanges on operational resilience in the financial sector and on financial stability implications from the insurance sector's exposure to climate risks. These are the types of discussions that we have with other major economies. Since we know a financial issue in a foreign country can quickly cascade to ours, and I'm glad we're doing the same with China. This technical exchange builds on other spheres of cooperation. This includes our efforts to alleviate debt distress in emerging markets and developing countries. We've seen progress over the past few months on specific debt cases, such as Zambia's. I have and will continue to push as hard as I can to build greater momentum in other outstanding debt cases. I've also been pleased by the progress we've made in conversations around sustainable finance, and I'm committed to moving our climate cooperation with China forward. Alongside these specific steps, I also exchange views with Chinese officials on the macroeconomy and national security. I shared my assessment that the American economy remains strong, with President Biden's historic economic agenda driving both our current resilience and long-term growth. We also discussed risks to the resilient global outlook. I was able to learn more about how the Chinese government views their current economic and financial situation 
in the steps that they have and are contemplating taking. These exchanges help inform our government's own economic decision making. We also had difficult conversations about national security. President Biden and I are determined to do all that we can to stem the flow of material that's supporting Russia's defense industrial base and helping it to wage war against Ukraine. We continue to be concerned about the role that any firms, including those in the PRC, are playing in Russia's military procurement. I stress that companies, including those in the PRC, must not provide material support for Russia's war, and that they will face significant consequences if they do. And I reinforce that any banks that facilitate significant transactions to channel military or dual-use goods to Russia's defense industrial base expose themselves to the risk of U.S. sanctions. We also exchanged information on the use of economic tools in the national security space. Going forward, I believe that we must continue to discuss how each side defines national security in the economic sphere. While well, the U.S. needs to continually evaluate its national security measures, given the rapid pace of technological development, we're committed to no surprises. We've privately and publicly laid out our perspective at length, along with the principles and processes that we undertake in formulating our policies. Our actions are implemented through transparent rules and regulations with ample comment periods. And we would welcome transparency from the PRC on its national security actions and greater clarity on where it sees the line between national security and economic issues. This would provide greater stability to the relationship while also helping foster confidence for firms doing business with the PRC, which is in China's interest. Vice Premier He and I committed to stay in close touch about these issues. The United States will also be hosting our Chinese counterparts next week for the fourth meetings of the Economic and Financial Working Groups, where these issues will be discussed at length. So let me end with this. The work of diplomacy is not easy, but in the few months since the Woodside Summit, and certainly since I visited Beijing last summer, we have taken major steps to stabilize the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. And during this trip, we have been able to build on that foundation to move the ball forward on specific issues that matter to Americans. That does not mean we have resolved all our differences. There is much more work to do. And it remains unclear what this relationship will endure in the months and years ahead. But as we proceed, we must remember that its trajectory is not predetermined. It depends on the choices that each of our countries make. I know that the American people expect a clear-eyed approach to China, one that proceeds with confidence about the economic strength of our country and protects our national security, while finding a way forward so that both countries can live in a world of peace and prosperity. The President and I are firmly committed to continue to deliver on that. Thank you. I'd be glad to take your questions. First question goes to Alan Rappaport with the New York Times. Thank you, uh, Secretary Yellen. Um, following your meeting with the Premier, uh, his office put out a statement saying that the U.S. should refrain from politicizing and national securitizing economics and trade um, and appeared to be dismissive of some of the concerns that you raised about overcapacity. What's your response to that? Um, and if China does not make changes, what types of measures do you think uh, should be considered to protect the green energy industries that the Biden administration is trying to develop? Well, I believe that 
um, in several hours of conversation on this topic that I was able to make very clear the basis for our concerns about Chinese overcapacity and that our concerns are not U.S. concerns alone, but um, also reflect the views um, of our allies in Europe, in Japan, and in developing emerging markets, uh, Mexico, India, among others. So this is a widespread set of concerns, and I believe he heard very clearly my view that this is something that, if not addressed, will injure American workers and firms. And I think he also understands that we have concerns with respect to our supply chain resilience about developing undue over-dependence on China as a source of supply in areas like um, clean energy, which will clearly be expanding in the decades ahead. And we need to have some participation in this, as our allies do. Um, so uh, we agreed, as I mentioned, to launch intensive exchanges on balanced growth in the domestic and global economies. The reason for that is because the Chinese have heard our concern with the potential impact on American workers and firms and realize that we need to um, discuss this and address this um, collaboratively. This question goes to Fatima Hussein from the Associated Press. Hi, Secretary Yellen. <clears throat> Forgive my voice. Um, <clears throat> your counterparts brought up TikTok in your discussions. Um, was any progress made on resolving that issue? Is it practical? to ban the app in the U.S. and on overcapacity, what are you looking for China to do in sectors like EV and solar where it already exists? Are you looking for voluntary restrictions on exports? So let me start with TikTok. It's a subject that was raised um, in our meetings. We discussed it briefly. Um, you know, the president has made clear there's a, a bill in the House that if passed, he indicated he would sign. And um, I am certainly supportive of efforts by our administration to address national security issues that relate to sensitive personal data. So our concern here has to do with sensitive personal data and protecting it. Uh, this is a legitimate concern. It's a concern that China, for its part, also is concerned about. Many um, U.S. social apps um, are not allowed to operate in China. Um, we would like to find a way forward. Of course, this is important to the Chinese. Um, we will, you know, the president made clear he would sign the House legislation. Sorry, there was a second. <clears throat> On overcapacity, whether EV, battery, um, solar, anything that already exists, whether you're looking for voluntary export restrictions. Well, I don't have anything specific to say here. This is a problem that has developed over many years. I think, importantly, it reflects Chinese um, policies that place great priority on these sectors, channel support to them, enable them to continue operating even when prices drop to very low levels due to overcapacity and their firms don't exit um, the market. Instead, it's potentially our firms that have to do so. Um, I think some changes in policy, as I mentioned, on the Chinese side are necessary and appropriate, and um, these, these are matters that we will begin discussing um, as early as next week when the Economic Working Group uh, convenes again. Next question will go to Courtney Brown with Axios. 
Uh, thanks for taking our questions, Secretary Yellen. I wanted to follow up on what Alan asked. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks that the Biden administration won't accept the reality of what happened over a decade ago with the first China shock. Um, so how far is the Biden administration willing to go to prevent that from becoming a reality? What are some of the specific actions that you could take? Well, I don't want to get ahead of where we are on this, but um, I did uh, last week visit a firm in Atlanta called Cineva that was um, a dynamic and technologically advanced producer of solar cells um, in the early 2000s. This was a time when China ramped up its capacity to produce solar panels enormously. Prices plummeted, and in 2017, the firm finally had losses that were so steep um, it went out of it went out of business. It went bankrupt, and it, one of the goals of the Inflation Reduction Act, of course, that's um, a, a key goal is to reduce emissions to address climate change, but also it's intended to bolster our supply chains and create some capacity in the United, the United States to produce these cl critical clean energy products. And there are a series of supports there and restrictions that um, have enabled this firm to feel it now has the potential to operate profitably. But we recognize that continued investment in ca capacity in these areas in China that outstrips glo growing global demand really could again threaten a company like this. And I would simply say that the impact of that, you mentioned the first China shock. That was something that happened um, in the years after China joined the World Trade Organization. Its production of many manufactured goods ramped up dramatically, and there was tremendous loss in jobs, maybe up to two million jobs in the United States that really led to the hollowing out of industrial production in many parts of the country and had a very negative impact on American workers. I don't believe President, President Biden, this is something he's very focused on, wanting to reverse these adverse effects that American workers have seen. And I simply would say it would not be acceptable to the United States, to President Biden, to allow this to happen again. Exactly what the right tools are, I don't want to get ahead of where we are, but I believe that um, it's critical that our Chinese counterparts understand the importance that we place on addressing this, and I believe they have tools um, that they can use to ease this problem. Next question will go to Andy Duran, The Wall Street Journal. Hi, Secretary Yellen. Uh, you mentioned the recent stability in U.S.-China ties that some of this recent diplomacy has helped achieve. I'm wondering if this overcapacity issue does kind of become the worst case scenario and a repeat of the first China shock, as you mentioned. I mean, is that something that you think has the potential to destabilize this recent momentum? I mean, is this uh, central to kind of the future of the bilateral relationship, whether this issue can be resolved successfully? Well, it is a critical issue, and it is one that could have an adverse impact on American workers and firms if we don't find um, a solution. So I, I believe we have a commitment with the Chinese to try to work cooperatively to understand the economic concerns that each of us has. Um, and this is a very important concern of ours. I think my job here is to make sure I've explained this very thoroughly and presented this concern at the highest levels of Chinese leadership 
so that they understand the importance that we attach to this. I do not want to see the U.S. economic relationship or overall relationship with China um, deteriorate and fray. And I believe the Chinese are undertaking these um, consultations and ongoing exchanges because they share a similar desire to stabilize our relationship that we both see the benefits of a strong e trade and investment relationships. As I said, there are gains to us from being able to sell into a huge uh, Chinese market for many American firms. It supports many jobs. And the Chinese gain similar benefits. Um, we have a deep relationship in terms of trade and investment. And I think neither side would wish to see this relationship um, really to decouple. So we're working together honestly in good faith to have frank and candid discussions and to find a way forward that is constructive. Next question will go to Mark Stewart with CNN. Good afternoon, Secretary Yellen. Uh, I want to continue uh, the conversation about the current business environment. Uh, whether it be TikTok or EVs, there is a lot of suspicion from Washington, from Wall Street, and from Main Street toward Chinese firms. Having made yet another trip now to China, I'm wondering, is this skepticism warranted? And how will you know if a threshold has been reached, a new level of comfort for American firms to feel encouraged to do business here in China? So we, we have talked with American firms and made an effort to understand their concerns. And um, to some extent, I think their concerns reflect Chinese actions that um, worry them, um, like actions that have been taken against certain consulting firms working with American businesses, or more recently, um, a decision not to allow Intel or AMD chips. And um, the American firms are unclear exactly what kinds of steps China might, might take in the future. And um, I've tried in our conversations to make clear that this is a reason for caution on the part of American firms um, about doing business here. That said, there are many American firms with deep and long involvement in China that continue to do um, very profitable businesses that they're very committed to here. So I wouldn't overemphasize this problem, but I think on each side we need to be as transparent as we can about our national security concerns and how the actions we take relate to resolving those concerns. That's often what the Chinese say, is that this reflects a national security concern. As I mentioned, um, when we've put restrictions in place, we've um, proposed rules, gone through a full um, rulemaking process in which we take comments and make very clear what the rules of the game are, and I think that would be helpful on the Chinese side as well. And the final question will go to Wang Li Wei from Tsai Xin. Hi, Secretary Yellen. Uh, I study econ in Colombia. Very much share your concern of the overcapacity issue on China and beyond. Uh, but I want, also want to, uh, be in keeping with your spirit of being constructive for this trip, um, in the short term, from what I talked to some uh, former Chinese uh, senior officials, a uh, solution from supply side is relatively limited on this overcapacity issue because it, it is tied to China's development model where local governments is very active. And at this stage, where the economy is already weak, local governments wouldn't want company to go bankrupt, as you just mentioned, 
uh, fearing layoff and potential uh, social stability issues. So uh, do you get some inkling from your discussion with Chinese policymakers uh, on what could be done in the short to medium term, or perhaps uh, what you raised in terms of solutions as you are a top uh, macroeconomist. <laughs> well, there's supply and then there's also demand. And so we've had conversations with our Chinese counterparts about the demand side of the equation and the fact that China's saving rate is among the highest in the world and even at this advanced stage of development remains close to 45 percent. The, um, the, the flip side of a very high saving rate is that consumer spending as a share of GDP is quite low in China relative to other um, countries at this level of income. And so one possible approach would be to boost demand and uh, to see a larger share of GDP accrue to households to bolster their income or, and or um, to, for example, bolster retirement security, the ability to afford education for one's children and so forth. Um, which are motives for very high saving, and call that rebalancing. And this is a matter that we have discussed over more than a decade in China. And um, I, too, have uh, talked to many officials and um, members of the academic community who think that that needs to be part of the solution. If consumer spending were higher as a share of GDP, there would be less need to have such large investment um, going, going into building supply. That concludes today's press conference. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks.